you ever thought about what would happen if you had to have a surgery, but you refuse to have anesthesia? You'd be surprised how often this question comes up. Some people are scared of not waking up or they've had a bad reaction in the past. And sometimes people just say, I don't want to be put under or I can't deal with losing control of my brain and body. So what really happens if you tell your surgeon no anesthesia? Can the operation still go on? Will the doctors and nurses just hold you down and do it anyway? Well, the short answer is no, but the long answer is where things get really interesting. So let's get into it. All right, let's start by asking the obvious. Why would anyone refuse anesthesia in the first place? You might think it's rare, but it happens more often than you'd expect. Some people are terrified of anesthesia, not of pain, but of being unconscious. They've heard stories of people being awake during surgery or waking up nauseated and confused or not waking up at all. That fear of losing control is real. Others might have had a bad experience before, maybe severe nausea, memory gaps, or delirium after surgery. Sometimes the fear isn't medical at all, it's cultural, religious, or philosophical. I've had patients who said things like, I want to be present and experience everything consciously, or my faith doesn't allow me to use drugs of any kind. And then there are people who've read some one in a billion horror story about anesthesia online, and now that's stuck in their head. Of course they're going to be scared of it. As anesthesiologists, when we meet a patient who refuses anesthesia, our first step isn't to argue, it's to listen. We need to try and understand the reasons behind that fear, because sometimes the fear isn't really about anesthesia. It's about control, trust, or trauma, sometimes. And believe it or not, once that conversation happens, and once we can explain what anesthesia really is, how it works, and how carefully it's monitored, a lot of patients actually start to reconsider it. But still, sometimes they just flat out refuse it. And that's where things start to get complicated. In medicine, there's a principle we live by, patient autonomy. It means that every competent adult has the right to make their own medical decisions, even if those decisions might harm them. And that includes the right to refuse anesthesia. If the patient says, I understand the risks, but I don't want anesthesia, we can't force them to take it. It doesn't matter if we think it's the right choice or not. As long as they're competent and fully informed, we have to respect that decision. But, and everyone's always got a but, autonomy has limits. If someone is confused, intoxicated, or delusional, they might not be legally capable of giving or refusing consent. And if it's an emergency, like say they're unconscious and bleeding from a gunshot wound, we operate under what's called implied consent. In other words, if they could speak, most reasonable people would probably say, yes, please say you want. So while you can absolutely refuse anesthesia, the real world response depends on context. What's the nature of your condition? Are you mentally competent? And exactly how urgent is the situation? All right, so let's go with this for a second. You've refused anesthesia and the surgeon says, okay, but you understand what that means, right? What actually happens next? Well, it ain't pretty. Picture yourself lying on an operating table. The lights are bright. You can hear the monitor beeping. You feel the cold of the surgical prep on your skin. And then you feel the first cut. Without anesthesia, every nerve ending in that area sends pain signals up your spinal cord and straight into your brain's pain centers, the somatosensory cortex and the limbic system, including the thalamus. Of course, the result is intense, unbearable pain. And it's not just about what you feel. Your body reacts to this too. Your heart rate spikes, your blood pressure surges, you start to hyperventilate, your stress hormones go through the roof. You might even go into shock from the trauma. This isn't theoretical. This is exactly what used to happen before anesthesia was invented. In the early 1800s, surgeries were done fully awake. Patients were restrained, surgeons worked as fast as humanly possible, and countless people died, not from the surgery itself, but from pain-induced cardiac arrest. Yeah, that's a thing. So unless you're a monk or something, you probably won't be able to just sit back and tough it out. The body's stress response is just too powerful for the vast majority of us to endure for any length of time. But now here's the good news. Anesthesia isn't an all or nothing choice. When most people say they're refusing anesthesia, what they usually mean is they're refusing general anesthesia, the complete loss of consciousness. But there are other options that can keep you awake, comfortable, and pain-free, sometimes. For example, there's local anesthesia. That's when we numb just a small area, like when you get stitches or dental work. Then there's regional anesthesia. Think spinal or epidural anesthesia, or nerve blocks for specific limbs. You stay awake, but you don't feel pain in that region. And sometimes we can combine those techniques with light sedation, so you're drowsy, relaxed, and usually don't remember much, but you're still breathing on your own. So if someone says, I don't want to be put under, we can often find a safe compromise. The idea is to try and find a level of comfort and safety that matches what the patient wants and needs. To a certain extent, modern anesthesia is customizable. It's not always a one-size-fits-all kind of situation. Now, if we're talking about real medical emergencies, then things get a little trickier. Let's say someone has previously said, no anesthesia, no matter what. Then they end up in the emergency room unconscious, bleeding internally, 
and in need of emergency surgery. If there's no documentation of that refusal, like no written note or advance directive, then the medical team is obligated to act in the patient's best interest. That means anesthesia, surgery, the whole package. But if there is a clear written refusal, something that's been signed and witnessed, then ethically and legally, we have to honor that, even if their condition is life-threatening. And let me tell you, these situations can be really heartbreaking. They usually involve hospital ethics committees, legal counsels, and family discussions. Nobody wants to watch a patient suffer, but doctors also have to respect the law and the patient's autonomy. So what about people who truly don't want any anesthesia at all? No general, no regional, no local, nothing. Well, there are still a few things some places might be able to offer, though none come close to true anesthesia. Sometimes hypnosis or guided imagery can help for minor procedures. Believe it or not, there's real science showing that focused mental techniques can change how the brain perceives pain. Distraction techniques like music therapy, VR headsets, and meditation can help too. But these are all partial measures, and most of the anesthesia providers I know, including myself, aren't trained for anything like that. Besides, for anything invasive like open abdominal or open heart surgery, they just can't block pain at the same level needed in order for a surgeon to perform their job safely. So while it's possible to do some very small things without anesthesia, large operations without it are pretty much impossible because the average human just can't handle it. Now what about the hospital or the doctors? Can we refuse to do a surgery without anesthesia? Well, when someone refuses anesthesia, it triggers a very long formal process in the hospital. The anesthesiologist sits down with the patient, explains the risks, and documents everything meticulously. The conversation, the patient's understanding, the alternatives offered, all that goes into the medical record. If the refusal might endanger the patient's life, the anesthesiologist will often consult an ethics committee or risk management team. It's not only about covering ourselves legally, it's about protecting the patient's wishes and making sure every possible option has been explored. As for the doctors refusing, there are many instances where that's possible. For example, as a neuroanesthesiologist, if I were assigned to an open heart surgery one day, I would almost certainly refuse because I haven't done one of those since I was a resident, and I had a teacher with me the whole time making sure I didn't do anything stupid or dangerous for the patient. And those are insanely complicated cases that require knowledge of drugs I don't use on a regular basis, understanding of a heart-lung bypass machine, and cardiac physiology that I just am not that familiar with anymore. I mean, that's why cardiac anesthesia is its own specialty. Now, of course, the higher ups at my hospital might come back and say, listen, we're really sorry, but you're the only one here who can do this case. And this person is gonna die if you don't go in there and do the anesthesia for them. It's not very likely, but in that case, I might reconsider and do what I can to help. I would definitely not be happy about it, but I'd probably feel like it were the lesser of two evils to at least give it a shot. Or I might just continue to refuse anyway. I could be thinking, I'm not qualified to do this, so I'm not gonna be responsible for potentially killing this person, even if they might die anyway. And who's to say which decision is the right one? Now, let me just say that this has never happened to me or anyone I know. Of course, the admins and department chairs know that an underqualified anesthesia provider is not the best way to provide good patient care. We have general anesthesiologists, as well as cardiac, neuro, pediatric, obstetric, critical care, and lots of other anesthesia specialists on staff and on call 24 hours a day, every day of the year. But the question was, could we refuse to do a surgery? And the answer is technically yes, but realistically, it's not very likely to happen. Now, there are actually some pretty interesting real world examples of people staying awake during surgery. Take awake brain surgery, for instance. Neurosurgeons sometimes need patients conscious in order to test speech, memory, or movement during the operation. But those patients aren't suffering, they're under regional anesthesia and light sedation, and they're at least, you know, relatively comfortable. Or look at C-sections under spinal anesthesia. The mother's awake and gets to hear the baby's first cry, but feels no pain at all. Then there's the historical perspective. Before ether anesthesia was introduced in 1846, speed surgeons were a real thing. These guys were admired for how fast they could amputate a limb, not how well. The faster they worked, the better the chance the patient survived. It's really incredible to think that in less than two centuries, we went from that to being able to perform open heart surgery on a sleeping, pain-free patient whose vital signs we can control to the millisecond. So what happens if you refuse anesthesia? Well, legally you have that right, and ethically, we try our best to respect and accept it. But biologically, it's a real problem. Without anesthesia, most surgeries would be excruciating, dangerous, and in many cases, fatal. Fortunately, anesthesia today isn't just one thing. It's a whole toolbox. From local numbing to deep sleep, from spinal blocks to conscious sedation, there's almost always a way to keep you safe and comfortable. The best approach is to have an open, honest conversation with your anesthesiologist. Ask questions and share your fears there's almost always a way to find common ground. Because at the end of the day, anesthesia isn't about losing control, 
It's about trusting someone else to keep you safe while you're on a quick time travel vacation. If you found this video interesting, maybe share it with someone who's afraid of going under and drop me a comment if you've ever refused anesthesia or if you think you might ever. Thanks for staying with me all the way to the end. I really do appreciate it. Stay safe and I'll see you in the next one.